talk about movies for just a second? It's 2018. It's three years past where Marty McFly traveled in Back to the Future Part 2, and we still haven't seen all the cool stuff they predicted in that movie. Who gives? Where's my hoverboard? Where's my aluminum sunglasses? Where's my double tie? I want my double tie. But more than anything, where's my Mr. Fusion? You know, the device that Doc Brown puts on the back of the DeLorean that with just a few scraps of garbage created as much energy as the lightning bolt that they had to use earlier in the film? Mr. Fusion clearly was named after Mr. Coffee, by the way, which is also a good source of energy. But in fairness, back in 1985, it was not weird at all to think that fusion would be happening in the next 30 years. The problem is, they thought the same thing 30 years before that. It's been said that fusion is the energy source of the future, and always will be. But the last several years have actually seen a whole new wave of fusion research, and we're breaking new milestones all the time. Could fusion really be, finally, right around the corner? Nuclear energy is nothing new. We've been using nuclear energy to turn our lights on and heat our homes and create dank memes for decades now. And it kind of splits a crowd. It's far less polluting than almost any other kind of energy, but the pollution it does create is a doozy. Nuclear waste is dangerously radioactive for tens of thousands of years, which creates a whole new problem, because how do you let somebody 10,000 years in the future know, hey, you know, don't dig here. It's kind of the opposite of the clock of the long now. Instead of building a monument that people will want to visit for 10,000 years, we're creating a place that people will want to stay away from for 10,000 years. This is the worst game of geocaching ever. This is, of course, nuclear fission, which harnesses energy from splitting huge atoms like uranium in a chain reaction. But this isn't a natural process. I mean, radioactive decay occurs in nature, but it's not what, say, powers the sun and the stars. That's nuclear fusion. Fusion is basically the opposite of fission. While fission is taking one large atom and splitting it into two atoms, fusion fuses smaller atoms into bigger atoms. Wait, if fusion is fusing, is fission fissing? I am fissing this bread. I am fissing this paper. I am fizzing this dog. Dogs are hard to fizz. In the sun, this works by forcing hydrogen atoms together so tightly that they fuse into helium, which takes a lot of pressure to do because hydrogen nuclei are basically protons, and protons are both positively charged and repel each other. Luckily, the sun is insanely huge. It is 99.8% of the mass of our solar system. Remember this picture of North America on Jupiter? Jupiter is only a fraction of a percent the size of the sun. So with that much mass and energy, it just crushes down into this insane cauldron of pressure that releases enormous amounts of energy, many times by mass more energy than fission. And the end result is helium, which we're kind of running out of anyway. This is why the idea of fusion power is so alluring. The fuel is plentiful, it creates more energy than almost any other type of energy production out there, it has almost no impact on the environment, and it's all the time, it's regular, it's controllable, it's not like wind and solar that's intermittent. It truly is the holy grail of energy production. But in order to achieve this, we have to recreate conditions at the core of the sun. I <laughs> mean, how hard can that be? Hard. Like, really flinging, blanging hard. As hard as fizzing a dog. <sighs> it's so hard to fizz. The conditions that we're concerned about here are temperature and pressure. What kind of temperature? How does a million degrees Celsius sound? Hot. Sounds hot. But how do you contain something that's a hundred million degrees without melting the container that it's in? by suspending it with superconducting electromagnets. Electromagnets cooled by liquid helium at just a few degrees above absolute zero. As Karzgesak points out in their video, this is the greatest temperature differential in the entire universe, followed closely behind by a microwave burrito. Now that's a technique called magnetic confinement. Another technique called inertial confinement takes a small pellet of hydrogen fuel and bombards it from all sides by super powerful lasers. The history of fusion energy is a history of human beings trying to create a sun on planet Earth. That's why it's sometimes called a star in a jar. The first experiments with nuclear fusion took place in particle accelerators in the 1930, followed closely after by the world's first thermonuclear bomb because, of course, the first thing we're going to do with it is blow some stuff up. But at the same time we are blowing stuff up, we are also coming up with the first magnetic confinement reactor designs called the Tokamak and the Stellarator, which, by the way, two of the best band names I've ever heard. This Sunday at the Poughkeepsie Civic Center, Tokamak featuring Stellarator. 
ages 5 and up. The token map was created by Andrei Sakharov and Igor Tam, both scientists in the Soviet Union, and it basically looks like a donut that the plasma circles inside of, held in place by powerful electromagnets. The Stellarator design, proposed by Lyman Spitzer at Princeton, is the same idea as the tokamak, but it twists the magnetic field around the plasma in a 3D form to cause it to compress further and create more collisions and fusion opportunities. Lyman Spitzer, by the way, is the guy who the Spitzer Space Telescope is named after. Meanwhile, inertial confinement reactors started springing up in forms that they call the linear pinch design or the Z-pinch, which basically compresses plasma in a linear form instead of in a circle. Experiments like Zeta and Spectre 3 in the UK started running tests and they were able to hold a stable plasma for 300 microseconds. It's actually a big deal. So at the time, while the fission reactors starting to come up and feed energy into the grid, everything was coming up nuclear at the time. And so many physicists were assuming that fusion would follow the same trajectory and we'd have homes powered by fusion energy in about 20 years. Yeah, that didn't happen. It turns out that creating plasma and getting atoms to fuse is one thing. Creating a stable plasma that you can actually get energy out of, that's something else. Fusion technology would progress in fits and starts over the years, but the progress always seems so small compared to the hype and the promise around fusion energy. Yes, fusion energy it can give us limitless energy with no pollution. Yes, we held a stable plasma for five seconds. The surge of experimentation in the 50s was great, but it didn't lead to any tangible benefits that the general public could see. And again, in the 70s, there was a big wave of headlines around fusion energy. And again, nothing. Flurry of new fusion reactor development sprang up yet again in the 90s, this time centered around uh, new types of hydrogen, the isotopes deuterium and tritium were being used this time around, and this time in much bigger reactors that had a new international cooperation around them. Projects like the Tokamak Fusion Test Reactor in Princeton and the Joint European Taurus, or JET, in the UK, which was an international collaboration that did achieve the world's first controlled release of fusion power. Milestones were shattered in the 90s and some of the key parameters of nuclear fusion being temperature, pressure, and time of sustained plasma. Some of the reactors in the United States actually were able to produce several hundred million uh, degrees Celsius reactions and the JT60 reactor in Japan broke records for sustained plasma time. Excitement for fusion energy was at a fever pitch because for the first time we were actually creating energy from fusion. It just wasn't as much as the energy we were putting into it. Creating the conditions of the sun's core in a lab, turns out, uh, takes a lot of energy. And therein lies the rub. You want to be getting energy out of a reactor more than you're putting into the reactor. And while we were getting really close to that break-even point, we weren't quite there. So, once again, popular interest faded. There was a little bit of a Charlie Brown trying to kick the football thing going on. Disproven claims of cold fusion that kept popping up didn't help things out much either. But now in the 2010s we're seeing a whole new wave of nuclear research springing up and this time the projects are scaled up and bigger with even more international partners. The Korean Superconducting Tokamak Advanced Research Reactor, or STAR, broke the world record in 2016 by holding a high-performance plasma for 70 seconds. That record was quickly beat by China at the Experimental Advanced Superconducting Tokamak, or EAST, by holding a plasma for over 100 seconds in 2017. And scientists at the Alcator CMOD reactor at MIT broke the record for pressure at 2.05 atmospheres in 2016. But one of the most talked about projects is the Wendelstein 7X Stellarator reactor, which, if that name doesn't give you a nerd chubby, I don't know what will. This is being built at the Max Planck Institute in Germany in collaboration with the US, and it was actually designed by a supercomputer to get the electromagnetic fields just right, and it's proven to be incredibly accurate, only one error in 100,000. It's also the biggest Stellarator ever built, which, when fully operational, should be able to hold a plasma for 30 minutes. The first test of the 7X began in 2015, just to measure the magnetic field conditions with helium gas, and they created their first hydrogen plasma in 2016, reaching temperatures of 100 million degrees Celsius for a quarter of a second, and then it shut down for upgrades. It's expected to be fully operational in 2019, with a steady state operation soon after. But the project that's getting the most attention these days is the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, or ITER. It's currently under construction in France, and ITER is designed to be sort of a bridge between the experimental world of fusion energy and the commercial world of fusion energy production. Kind of the last step before we have actual fusion power plants out there. ITER is a joint project supported by the 28 member countries of the European Union, plus Switzerland, China, Russia, the United States, India, Japan, and Korea. This is a project that is not messing around. 
IDER, once operational, will be the first fusion reactor to smash the break-even barrier and produce 10 times the amount of energy going into it. It's expected to produce 500 megawatts of power while operating on 50 megawatts. On top of breaking those important milestones, IDER is also supposed to test the systems that would be needed to actually run a functional nuclear power plant from fusion. And uh, it's not going to actually be plugged into the grid itself, but it is going to sort of create the blueprint for a project called DEMO, which will be the first nuclear fusion power plant set to go up in the 2030s. This is a massive project, as you can imagine, with all those countries involved, but it is the first project that's expected to create net energy, which will pave the way for commercial nuclear fusion. So yeah, it feels like every other month or so we're hearing about some new breakthrough in nuclear fusion, so excitement is building around it again. But haven't we seen this movie before? Well, yes, but there is a difference this time, and that difference is private industry. Just like the private companies SpaceX, Blue Origin, and Rocket Lab are heralding a new space race, private industry is getting into the fusion game as well and developing their own reactors with commercial applications. Because let's face it, the company that cracks the code and actually puts commercial fusion energy on the market is going to own the world. And right now there are multiple private companies vying for world domination, each of them with their own unique spin on the idea. The cleverly named Tokamak Energy out of the UK is building a small, compact, spherical tokamak called the ST40, which is the first step toward a fusion power station by the year 2030. Spark is a collaboration between MIT and a startup called Commonwealth Fusion Systems, which has raised over $50 million from companies like Eni, an Italian oil company. They have the goal of getting a working reactor online in 15 years. Tri-Alpha Energy is working on a modified pinch design that forces the two hydrogen plasmas together and then uses neutral beam injections to maintain a tight field reverse configuration to accelerate fusion reactions. You know, that thing. And General Fusion, based out of Canada, has a unique hybrid design that surrounds the hydrogen plasma with a liquid metal, which is then compressed together by pistons, which creates fusion reactions that heat the liquid metal, which is then piped out to boil water to create steam, which turns turbines for electricity. And it does this once a second almost like a fusion combustion engine. General Fusion also has the backing of Jeff Bezos. Linus Tech Tips did a walkthrough of the facility. It did a really cool breakdown of the whole thing. I'll put the video right here. And all these private companies have an incentive to accelerate the adoption of nuclear fusion energy because let's face it, that's when they get paid. And they're all angling for around the 2030s. In other words, we've gone from saying that nuclear fusion is 20 years away to saying that it's 12 years away. So that's an improvement. So? Is it time to get excited? Again? I will say that while researching this, I found out that there have been a lot more progress in fusion technologies than I was aware of. And I do think that private industry getting involved does indicate a bit of a tipping point because people don't invest money in something unless it's proven or close to it. And that does get me a little excited. I mean, I get a lot of comments from people who say that government shouldn't be spending taxpayer money on scientific research, that that should be left up to private industry, that government's going to screw it all up. And look, I get the sentiment, I, I do, but I, I think that that early research kind of has to be publicly financed because there's just no incentive for a private company to put that kind of money into it. It kind of needs that public financing to get the research up to the point where private industry can take over and that's when real change occurs. And the change that we're talking about here is monumental. Clean energy, real clean energy, 24 hours a day from the most abundant fuel source on the planet with no environmental impact whatsoever. This is the dream and it's worth it. Some would argue we'll actually be screwed if we don't get it. And while the ever shifting timeline is frustrating, there, there is a side of this that I find really inspirational and that's all the people who have been working on this for all these decades, knowing full well that they're never gonna actually get to enjoy it. This is all stuff that's gonna happen outside of their lifetimes. You know, planting trees under whose shade they shall never sit. And if that isn't the best of humanity, I don't know what is. So tell me what you think. Are you jaded about fusion? Are you excited about it? Is it too early to tell? Talk about it down in the comments. Now, I purposefully didn't get into the weeds of the nuclear fusion process, like what actually happens in the core of the sun with the atoms and all that stuff, because, you know, <laughs> you got to pick your battles. But if you're a curious person and you want to know more about that, a great place to start is Brilliant.org. Longtime viewers of this channel have heard me talk about Brilliant. 
a lot, but this is the, exactly the type of subject that Brilliant is great for. It's this high level, super granular type of stuff with a lot of detail that you really have to work out every little step of the way. And that's what makes Brilliant so unique. They take a very complex topic and break it down so that you can understand it. And then you can apply that understanding to other areas of your life. But yeah, Brilliant has an astronomy course that covers several areas of astronomy from the size of the universe to exoplanets. But one section of this course focuses specifically on the life cycles of stars from a hot cloud of gas to a supernova it explains the whole thing. Go to brilliant.org slash answers with Joe and you can sign up to get free access to their weekly puzzles and brain teasers to help keep you smart. And the first 295 people to sign up for the premium subscription that gives you access to all their courses, get 20% off your subscription until the sun dies. That's a long time. If you like this channel, if you like learning, I think you'll like Brilliant too. So brilliant.org slash answers with Joe, links down in the description. Thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this video and a big huge thanks to the Answer Files on Patreon that make everything so much easier around here. I can't thank you enough. There's some new people that have joined. Want to give them a shout out just real quick. We've got Rory McCabe, Philip Pietropalo, Ian Valentine, Brandon Miller, Tommy Waldelo, Hassan Ahmed, Mark A. Putman, and John Benstead. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them and get access to stuff that normal people don't get to see, normal people, normals, you can go to uh, patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Please like and share this video if you liked it and if this is your first time here, uh, please check out some of my other stuff. And if you like those, you can hit subscribe and you'll get to see my videos every Monday and Thursday. And also hit the bell and you'll get notifications. That way you won't miss anything because YouTube's starting to throttle back that kind of stuff. All right, you guys go out, have an eye-opening week, and I'll catch you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care. Okay, it's a good girl. It's a good girl. I play with your doggy on the cameras. Mwah.